Let's get started. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Siming. I'm a technical leader within Cisco Engineering. I lead the development of PyTS and Genie, and today we are going to talk about network assurance using Cisco PyTS Genie for network engineers. We have a lot of things on our agenda. Now, so far, you've been here for the first day at Cisco Live Europe. I hope you're all enjoying it. And I'm hoping that, to some extent, here and there, you've already heard about PyTS through all the different sessions in Cisco DevNet. So we're going to talk about what it is at a very high level, where it came about, why it's of use to you, what are the different use cases that you can do with it, and as well, how to obtain it, how to use it, and the different layers of the infrastructure, solutions, examples, so on and so forth, right? So the goal is, at the end of this, while you may not be an expert yet in network automation, but at least you know where to get started, where to find the resources, and as well, why this solution may be helpful to you. So let's recap a little bit. Network engineering in 2020. Time flies, right? There's a lot of things that's going on. Software defined X, Yang, NetConf, RESTConf, NFV, Cloud, APIs. Suffice to say, I think it's pretty complicated. It's getting more and more challenging to do your work. Your network is evolving. Your network is going at an extreme speed where things are being changed, where all the dynamic aspect of things coming in which means automation today is no longer a luxury. It's a necessity. And when we talk about automation, there tends to be a very heavy focus on deploy deployment automation, on configuration automation, but not many people talk about verification. As network engineers, we focus a lot in this realm, in CLIs, because when we're trained as network engineers, we understand that, for example, show interface is going to give me all the details about my interfaces, and so on and so forth. So we're very natural dealing with text, which doesn't make a lot of sense from a programming perspective, but it makes sense to human. Now, the fact that we are looking at text means that we are prone to making mistakes, right? Comparing the left output and the right output, both are describing interfaces. There's a lot of noise in that output, but really the only thing I'm looking for is the fact that interf interface went, went down, right? That might be the cause of your network failure, but it does take a while to get there. I would say depending on the time of day you're asked to look at this problem, depending on the amount of coffee that you had, the amount of good sleep that you had, it might take longer or shorter. The point is we need to evolve with our network. We need to evolve as network engineers and get better at doing the stuff that we do and do less boilerplate boring stuff. So as of right now, you've probably heard a lot about Net DevOps, right? Net DevOps is something that DevNet has been pushing for. And really in one line, it's about bringing all that's good in software DevOps and apply it towards network. So that means you start with network infrastructure as code, and then you design rapidly, you deploy rapidly, you test rapidly, and you operate rapidly. Now, if you look at Hank's show earlier today, he's talking about a network engineer nine to five, right? A lot of it is about the mentality of being able to push changes, being able to iteratively push changes to your devices. But there's a critical piece. Looking at all the different tools that enables Net DevOps, people seem to not focus enough in the testing area. You can iteratively make changes or not make changes, but still your network may go down. You still need to verify at the end of the day whether things are still doing, doing well. So that's where we come in, so it's PyATS. A little bit of background, so I'm in engineering. PyATS originated as a test infrastructure for Cisco engineering as the newer generation, no longer next gen, newer generation seven years ago. Our team was building this infrastructure for Cisco engineering and today it's being used by a few thousand developers, quite a few million lines of test code within Cisco and millions of test runs. Suffice to say, if you're getting newer releases and buying new products from Cisco, um, chances are it's been already well tested throughout engineering in the engineering cycles using PyTS. So we are the de facto test infrastructure within Cisco engineering. The reason, the reason why I'm standing here and talking to you is because we, we've realized at some point that we have this huge value in our libraries. These libraries allow you to do network automation, to do your own testing from a customer perspective, right? So why ask you to buy something else when we can just give it to you for free? 
It's available to, for everyone right now on Cisco DevNet. It's all built in Python, and right now we're about 6,500 monthly downloads. You can get it in Docker format, you can just GitHub pull it, open source libraries, you can work on it, so on and so forth. And we'll get into that a little bit better. Now let's talk about how the solution works. When we see PyATS today, it means the entire solution. The solution comes in three parts. First is the very boring boilerplate test infrastructure. Remember, software architecture is like a pyramid. The bottom needs to be a very solid foundation. And the PyATS core infrastructure brings about that foundation. Next up, we talk about Genie. Genie is the standard PyATS library. It's the libraries that gives you things like device interaction, device libraries, parsing, getting output from your devices, interacting with devices, how to model things such as interface, BGP, how to sa snapshot, compare, and we'll talk about those use cases. And finally, the best part about PyATS and Genie is that because we just give you the libraries, you're in control. You build your own business logic and dictate what you want to do with the library. Whether you want to do testing, you want to do certification, you want to do DevOps, it's up to you. Like I said, the libraries are fully open source. One of the best part is that nowhere in the library do we say, if Cisco do this, else Juniper raise exception. The core infrastructure is 100% vendor platform feature and protocol agnostic, and everything, such as CLA, NetConf, gRPC, Cisco devices, Nokia devices, Juniper devices, they all come in as implementation details, connection plugins, extensions, and such. You can go to our link, github.com slash Cisco Test Automation to check out all the libraries and the library implementations. Automation is about being able to automate everything, right? When you push a single line of configuration change, the side effect could be massive, right? For example, on certain routers, you can actually turn off BGP. Uh, at least on Nexus, you can do feature BGP off, and then that will turn on the entire feature. The consequences are huge, yet sometimes we don't realize it, right? The point of being able to use automation is so that for, from a testing perspective, right, I want to know whether before I push an image to my production network, whether it's ready. That's certification testing. Providing test as a service when you're in your own lab, or if you have other test infrastructure, glue everything together. Now from a DevOps perspective, before you push those changes, how is my network operating today? How is my network operating after? Compare the two. Is the changes intended, right? Or keep tabs on what change on your network over time. For example, is my number of neighbors increasing? It's very hard to track how many precise neighbors that you have, but most people tend to have a rough estimate as network engineers. Now with an automated system, we can tell you exactly how many neighbors you have at any given time, how many verbs you have, how many BGP neighbors you got, how many interfaces you have up, so on and so forth, your interface counters. It helps you to pinpoint cause of failure and it allows you to be a little bit more proactive. Let's talk about the first thing. The simplest example from a automation perspective is to snapshot your network. Now most people when they think about snapshot, they think of configuration. Oh, let me save the configuration in a text file. Let me reapply it later, right? But we all know that configuration is only half the picture. In terms of driving a car, configuration is like the amount of throttle input and the amount of steering input that you gave. Operational state is like, for example, am I really turning? And how fast am I going? Because when you're standing still, you put the pedal down, you're accelerating, right? But if your engine is broken, let's say there's an issue, you put the pedal down, nothing can happen, right? So on our infrastructure, we focus a lot more on the operational side of things. So for instance, let's say I have a snapshot of how my interfaces and how my OSPF operational states are. So show OSPF, show all my routes, and so on and so forth. Something went wrong in my network. I don't know what happened. My job is to find out as a network engineer, but instead of going in and typing you know, commands and try to remember what happened yesterday versus you know, what's, what's going on now, imagine if I could just do a little diff of before or known good state versus bad state, right? Then I would be immediately able to pinpoint that, hey, it looks like someone shut down an interface, and the side effect is that on OSPF, it seems like I've lost a neighbor. Now, the infrastructure won't be able to tell you that this is intended or not. It'll just tell you that, hey, something gone missing. 
from an operation perspective, not configuration, operation perspective, you as a network engineer can now say, hey, looks like that's what happened. Let's show that in action. Let's see it in action just a little bit, a glimpse of what happens. So I have a snapshot of yesterday. Wrong directory. In my yesterday snapshot, I have both, for example, the operational state of OSPF on this device. And as well, if I don't trust it, well, let me give me the console. Whoops. This is the console output. So as we get operational states from your devices, we convert them into data structures. Now, let's say tomorrow something's gone wrong. I can simply do diff yesterday versus today. The system will go through the entire snapshot, look at what's interesting, what's not interesting, automatically ignores things such like uptime, certain counters that you might not care for, and so on, because we're network engineers, we built the library to be such. And then, the diff will tell you, well, it looks like on your Nexus interface, someone shut it down, and that operationally, we've lost a neighbor. All right, so this is where this is a very trivial situation, very trivial case, but it goes to show that we can immediately pinpoint what's going on. The reason why we can do this is because our first piece of our library implementation, parsing. The act of a parser takes CLI output and then converts it into a data structure in Python format. Right? I'm sure most people here have written some sort of regular expression to get certain information out of the output. It could be quite painful. And if you want to be very thorough, it's time consuming. Now, with PyTS and Genie out of the box, you have these parsers. There are thousands of them. So if you go to our website, seems like I have to end my show to show it. If you go to our website, developer.cisco.com slash pyets, go to our documentation site, you can quickly stroll through the list of APIs that we have. So for example, here is the list of all the different type of parsers that we have in the system pre-built. Now, first question that we get to ask is, does this include all the OS? Does this include all the command line? Not yet, but we're working on it, right? On a monthly basis, every, at the end of every month, on the last Tuesday of every month, we release a new version of PyTS and Genie. The version today is 19.12 because we released it in 2019, December. So the next version is coming out very fast, 20.1, 2020, January, okay? And with every release, we, we add additional parsers, additional libraries, and such. These libraries are open source, so for example, here is the different OSs that we currently cover. This gets updated whenever new libraries is checked in. If we look at show BGP instance all session, I promise you that this is open source, so I could go view source, and this takes me to GitHub where the actual implementation is. Right? If something doesn't work out for you, look at the code and try to fix it. Open a PR, add additional ones. So as an example, someone just committed, one of the customers that we, we deal with, um, they just committed a 500 uh, F5 parsers. We haven't merged it in yet because it's a big commit, but it goes to show once we open it up with the community, everybody's pitching in, right? Remember, Cisco is contributing to this. We work on this on a day-to-day -day basis, and now you can use it for your benefits as well. One of the challenges with parsers, now parsers are great, don't get me wrong, but one of the challenges with parsers is that commands can be different between different platforms. I'll give you a very simple example. Show interface versus show interfaces 
on XE versus NXOS. The context of the output may be similar from a human perspective, but the output is very different. How do we fix this? So we introduced another layer on top called models. What these models are, and they're not Yang models, they're Python models intended for humans. Yang models are great machine to machine, but once you get down to the leaf level, they're atomic, and it's very difficult for human to grasp. Our, pars our parser models sit at a higher level. So if you look at interface as an example, between different platforms, we issue different commands aggregate them all together into that single data structure. And that data structure remains the same across different platforms. Right? That means when you write a test script or you write some business logic that says, I should have this interface up and then these routes available and so on and so forth, you should be able to repeatedly run it over different devices without having to deal with device differences. That level of abstraction is built in into the system. So like I said, Genie is our standard library. All of these things, parsers, models, and so on that we're talking about is part of Genie. It's an agnostic framework with all these libraries, over 1,500 parsers, different feature protocol models, and open source triggers and verifications. We'll get to the trigger and verification in a little bit. I just want to show you how to navigate our API browser. So going back to our web page, I already showed you that Here's my parser list. I can search. Here's all the BGP-related parsers across different platforms. Now, like I said, there's a level higher than parsers called models. And here is the different feature or slash protocol models that we currently support. And these sit above parsers. Depending on which one, it automatically invokes the right APIs or the CLIs, aggregate the results, and build the top-level model. When we do, remember in the previous example, we did PyATS learn OSPF interface. That invokes the interface model and the OSPF model. And then take that output, save it to file so you can do a comparison later. If we look at the OSPF model, the model documentation says that the structure involves multiple CLI commands across different, different platforms, aggregating it all together giving you a final data structure that looks like this. So whenever now you do programming, you do automation on your platform, you can deal with all this. Now, another thing that I want to mention is, obviously, with all of these libraries, it's awesome. You can build your own business logic. Sounds like you, know, you can do some small level verification. But what about testing? How many people have done certification testing? New releases come into your, into your you know, production network and you have to test it. Some people do, some people have done it, right? It's a long process. We've heard it takes sometimes between two person, one to three months to do all the certification tests manually because there are, you have an Excel file of having the test cases, you're typing away, here's the input, here's the output, here's the result, and so on, right? That's a very lengthy process, which means the latest and hottest features, it takes you at least three months before you can roll it into production. What if you can just test everything automatically? So with Genie, we have a system called triggers and verification. These are reusable data-driven test cases. A trigger performs a change onto your device. A verification verifies whether it's behaving as expected. The way you drive it is with a data file, you say, I want these triggers, I want these verifications, send it to the engine and let it do its own comparison. A very trivial use case, configure interface, configure routes, set up all your protocols, start traffic. It should be working, right? How many, how many people really did a switch over and check that traffic is still working? You trust your network is resilient. You really do. But we only trust it to be resilient during the moment that it's supposed to be resilient. We don't really test it. Now with this, you can check everything is working, trigger a switch over, check everything is still working. That's a valid use case. You want to make sure that your network can automatically recover in a situation of disaster, but before the disaster itself. That's what the test cases can do. Now to run it, all you have to do is say, OK, I'm testing these features. I want to verify these things. Here is the test cases I want to run. 
Here's the test bed that I want to provide. The test bed is in YAML format. It describes how to connect to the test bed, the credentials and such. And then the system takes care of the rest. Let me show you what that means. First of all, here is the list of the different triggers and verifications so across different platforms. These test cases are pre-built for you, right? So your test plan, whether it is certification or whether you want to just do some destructive testing or you just want to make sure the next thing you're trying to do works, here is the different test cases that you can use. And if you want to do a lot of verification, here is test cases that you can use to do verification. All of these are open source. You can click on them and go to the source code. So for example, I want to verify multicast globals, view source, and then that will take you to the source. When you run, like I said, whoops. When you run, all you have to do is install PyATS, run this command. What you get in return is a series of log files. We have a built-in log viewer When you generate it, when you do any sort of automation, what happens is you generate all the log files, right? Because after you run them, you want to go back and see whether they work, not work. You, you want you need traceability. You need uh, you need to make sure that it did what it's intended to do. Now with PyTS, notice that this is hosted localhost on my laptop. I'm running it on my laptop, but the log file that I generated from my run, I can look at it directly. So for example. Here's a test case that tests ISIS. Here is the log that it generated. There's a lot of content there, so I can go back and look at what's happened. And in addition, what if I want to know what are all the commands that are issued? So here is a snapshot of within that test case, here is all the different CLIs that I've issued to the device. So at a glance, you pass this to management and say, look, this is how I did my certification test. Everything is passing. This is input, this is the output, this is the expected result, and we just saved a bunch of time. All right? Now, let's talk about potential integration, because so far what I've shown you is everything on our side of things. There is robot framework integration. So a lot of people are very interested in robot framework because it's a TDD-driven test framework, and it allows you to write keyword-driven approach. So for example, if you're not a software developer, if you're not a programmer, which a lot of network engineers tend to not be, this is something that we can all read. So as an example, I want to use this test bed, connect to the devices, verify that BGP is running on this device, do a configure and configure BGP, and verify it's, it recovered. Right, so this is human readable, and Robot Framework gives you that capability. Now, Robot Framework is an open source Python infrastructure, but in order to have keywords such as run verification, run trigger, verify count of number of VGP neighbors, those are what comes from the, from the, from the libraries on our side. So we've integrated with Robot Framework, and we provide out-of-the-box Robot Framework keywords that allow you to use Robot Framework and do network automation with it. If you're very interested in robot framework, there are robot framework-based sessions today um, in other workshops and so on. So that's somewhere you can learn more about robot framework. All right. So just to give you another piece of integration point that we can integrate with. How many people here uses Ansible? Oh, almost everybody. We all love Ansible. Now, Ansible is great at pushing configuration. Network as code is great, right? With Ansible, you have your configuration in Git. You push configuration changes when you need to, run the playbook, fine and dandy. What about verification? How many people try to do verification with Ansible? A little bit. Great. Now you can do better. right? So because we have this big set of libraries, we've worked with people that now have built and enabled Ansible verification and leveraged the libraries, the parsers that we have. I'm not going to repeat too much into it. Uh, because I didn't write the content myself. But if you go to this URL, this is a blog by uh, Colin McCarty, who is a senior Ansible developer at Red Hat. And it talks about precisely how PyTS, oh, sorry, I'm not sharing. My apologies. This is an article written by Colin McCarty on Ansible and ServiceNow. 
And part of it uses Python's genie to parse results from post-configuration changes, right? So it's all about integrating PyTS into your Ansible playbook, enable you to do that extra little step of verification. All right. Moving on. Let's talk about the next step of automation. So, so far, we talk about disaster recovery. I have today's snapshot, sorry, I have yesterday's snapshot, which works. I have today's snapshot, which something is problematic. I can do a, do a diff. Now, that's what I call post-mortem automation, because the things that shouldn't happen has already happened, right? Network is already in an outage. The tool helps you to identify issues. What you really want to do is you want to be a little bit more preemptive. You want to go from reactive automation, which means something has gone wrong, customer escalated, to it looks like that's about to go wrong. Let me go fix something. Let me go correct it, or let me prevent it from happening. One very simple use case of pre preemptive network automation example is CRC errors, CRC checker, right? Now, depending on which devices you're working with, you probably have less CRC issues over fiber optics, but let's say you're dealing with a lot of electrical interfaces and you're in a huge lab with a lot of interference, chances are you might run into these issues, right? Sometimes an application will flap because there is a lot of CRC errors and maybe it's time to change the cable or change the SFP. Now, when such things happen, there's a lot of fuss that happens People go and look at the configuration. People go and look at the operational states. Not everyone have the ability to pinpoint immediately that, oh, there's a CRC error, because it's not something that we think about on a daily basis. Now, with automation, you can write a simple script. And all it does is go to your devices, the show interface, check all the counters, verify whether they're good, bad, and tell you whether there are CRC errors over a certain limit and whatnot. You can configure that, right? But it gives you a peace of mind. The fact that these kind of automation, you can run it on a daily basis, nightly basis, sends you a nice email that says your network seems to be operational and you don't have to think about it again. Now, the next time there are interface CRC errors that are going up, the script will warn you first before the application set, uh, uh, triggers, right? This example script is available on our GitHub. So on github.com slash Cisco test automation solution examples, this is a script that was developed by one of the SCs we used to work with. He dealt with customer having that issue, so he felt like he needs to write a script that does this, and voila, here we are, right? So this is an applicable use case of our infrastructure. To give you an example of what it looks like when you actually run it, I have an actual log file. PyTS logs view CRC. And again, it brings up my browser. Looking at the archive zip file, it opens up the zip file and tells me that inside this script, I've connected to my devices. I issued a bunch of commands. Here's the actual CLI output from my devices. So if, if you don't trust the libraries, right, because sometimes the library can be broken, feel free to look at the output yourself. But bottom line is you should be able to go back to this guy Look at the CR CRC table, and here is all of my devices. Well, in this case, I'm running on a viral device, which means there are no CRC errors. They're all zero because they're virtual. But on a physical device, you absolutely can see some real results. OK? So that's one nice use case. How many people find that useful? All right. Very simple, applicable use case of automation. You can run it. You can write it, it's a very short script. Think of other use cases. Now let's try something even bigger. We all know the concept of chaos monkey, right? Very simple concept. Go onto a production network, wreck havoc, and hopefully your production network recovers, right? Chaos Monkey was not really invented by, by Netflix, but Netflix really applies it. They have a little script that goes around, pulls disks, disable servers, but really, you know, the streaming should stay live. Now, as network engineers, we all probably design networks that are resilient to change, resilient to disaster. It should switch over. It should go the other way, right? 
we don't really test it that much. Or how many people have heard of it, don't test in production? I'm pretty sure everyone's done it, right? But Chaos Monkey is precisely against that. It's about testing in production. But the point is you want to be a little bit more precise in what you're doing. Don't test everything in production. Be a little bit more controlled. Wreck chaos, break things in a controlled fashion, see your network recover automatically in the design spec, within design scope. Now, if it didn't, well, then you know there are, there's a real issue. But the best part is because you caused a chaotic thing to happen, you know how to recover from it, right? Let's say you shut down an interface. It didn't recover. Well, bring it back up. Now you should be back, right? But it's a lot better to do it yourself this way, using a script of such, than to let the actual outage happen because then you would have a real outage. Right? So something to think about. Chaos Monkey is a nice concept. We need to sort of move forward, get past our comfort zone, to define a new comfort zone, and feel more comfortable at night at the end of the day. Right? There is an existing script in our solution examples repo called net chaos, what it does is it defines a preset list of triggers. Remember, a trigger is a reusable test case that injects the change onto your device and recover from it. So all it does, it randomizes which trigger to run on, and it runs on your network. I would not advise to finish this course and then go and run it on your production network. Probably not a good idea. But you know, if you go over to our automation booth, you can bring up a lab environment using Viral replicate your production environment, and run something like this. Get a feel of it, right? It's a nice concept, something we want to get into. The next, one, next thing I want to show you is our dashboard. So, so far, everything that I've shown you is Python, Python, Python. Now, if you look at PyTS Learn, PyTS Parse, those are command line APIs that you can use without being a Python programmer, right? We do realize that everyone wants to eventually become a programmer, but we have to start somewhere. So with PyTS Learn, OSPF Interface, or Learn the Models, and Parse, and Diff, that's great. That's a starting point. But eventually, to build your own business logic, you get in a little bit into coding. And then you arrive at things such as the CRC script, the Chaos Monkey script, and there's a bunch of other scripts that you can make use of, all available on Automation Exchange and Code Exchange. But those are, again, still code. You're still dealing with non-UI. When you have it in production and you're comfortable with it, you want to make sure that you have a GUI-based system. And that's where our dashboard comes in. Our dashboard allows you to manage a list of topologies in a test environment, run test suites on those topologies, see it in action live, capture the results, look at the logs, and be able to triage from your failures. So this is a web-based system where once you have all these scripts that you have, register into the UI, click on play to run it, or schedule the run on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me give you a quick demo of that. I have here my special dashboard. So this is an internal instance that we have. Here's the list of all the jobs that I have. Never mind the JB test, but the triggers and verifications, learn a snapshot, parse, the, parse snapshot. If we talk about the CRC checker, I can run this script. Clicking run on this script, you know that DevNet has a sandbox. Sandbox has always on devices, so this testbed is using the DevNet always on sandbox. Assuming that it still work at this moment, I can submit it. And this will kick off a run in the back end. What this will do is actually check for CRC errors on this DevNet Sandbox device. Now, it does take a while to run, so I'm going to show you one of the existing results. This is one of my previous run earlier. It passed. This is the same script that it ran standalone, except this time it ran in, in my GUI-based system. And it seems like these are virtual port groups. and. This is how the script runs, right? The point is not whether this script is doing anything meaningful at this point, is that we can integrate the script into a UI system and then get the result out 
and even look at the environment. So for example, here is everything that was generated in this run. What the environment looked like, what the test log was, what the results are, and so on. So this GUI system manages all of that. My test bets are also managed by the system. So for example, in the DevNet Always On Sandbox, here's what the testbed YAML looks like. Wi-Fi is a little slow today. Here we go. This is what the testbed YAML looks like. Right? Now, before you get to, well, it looks like you got password in plain text here. There are ways to get around that. We have encrypted passwords. I'm putting it here so it's easier to visualize the fact that these are you know, password input boxes. I have a workshop coming up right after this, right in that corner, where I can show you how that works. Right? Now, the reason why we treat test pets like this is because there's a queue. Whenever you run any sort of testing, even just certification testing or verification and so on, you want to make sure that only a single person is using it at any given time. Imagine trying to do, do your testing, everybody at the same time, right? configuring different interfaces and so on. You could cause a lot of trouble. Right? So the point here is that whenever you register any script into the system and you run it, we automatically queue it against the current testbed. And if multiple people want to run different things, so for example, I want to run CRC, I want to run some triggers, I want to run some certification testing, and so on, it will queue up one after the other in priority sequence so that you all get reason, reasonable and meaningful results. As well, the latest feature that I want to show in this particular Cisco Live, this is an engineering pre-release demo. We've been working on this feature. So far, you've looked at Expresso as all scripts, scripts, scripts. What if you want to do snapshots and compare? So we've added the ability for you to define devices without having a testbed YAML. So in the UI, you just say, here's my device, here's the IP, username, and password, how to connect to it. If you want to parse output, select which parsers you're interested in, drag it into the right side, and or models, if you're interested in BGP interfaces and so on. And what you arrive is, now you can do a snapshot difference. And remember the, UI, remember the diff that we showed before in command line? Now you can do it straight in the UI. We're still working on polishing this UI and releasing it in the next few months. This is, this is the first time anyone has ever seen this UI. Let me give you a piece of that little action right in our web page. Hopefully it doesn't crash. I have a previous run that I've learned a snapshot on. I could do a comparison. The comparison is that there are differences. And if I go to the different side, here is the actual difference. If I want to do something different, I could go back to this side, create a new one. It's called the genie job. I want to create a new manual test bed. I want to do some triggers and verifications, or maybe I want to do some parsers instead. Let's keep it simple. Test demo, give it a name. The system works over Docker, so there are Docker images in the back pre-built pre with PyTS and Genie uh, added. So I'm going to select this guy. Here's my device, test device. Here's my IP. Let's assume it's an IXE device. I'm going to SSH to it. I've added the device to say, I want to take snapshots from this guy. Based on input, here's the list of all the parses that I currently have available in the system. I'm interested in it, so I just drag and drop. So the purpose of this is instead of going onto the command line and typing you know, the CLI that you're interested in, built what you're interested in from a parsing perspective, save and execute, and the system will run it in the back end. All right. Last piece, must be burning to know how I get my hands on this, right? People are still interested, sounds pretty good. I hear some heads not bobbing. That's good. That's good. So 
Pythias and Genie runs on any Linux-like environment. So from Python 3.5 to 3.7, you can still use Python 3.4, but I wouldn't recommend it because it's effectively phase out. Python 3.8 support is going to come out next month, so 20.2 release, February 2020. Um, you can run it in Windows, but it has to be Windows subsystem for Linux. We don't support direct native Windows environment because the process of forking is very different. Well, actually, it doesn't exist in Windows. Um, you can use any preferred editor, run it directly on your laptop. All you need is a Python virtual environment. Activate it and pip install PyTS full. That will bring down all of our packages directly from external PyP. We do not collect any telemetry, so we don't actually know which exactly customer is using it. You can use this in a closed lab environment, no network connectivity to the external world other than installation. You see the source code, you know exactly what we're trying to do, so you know we're not collecting stuff on you. Now to recap, it is fairly lightweight in the sense that it's all 100% Python, but because PyTS and Genie is Python, it's also fairly powerful because you can scale it. When we learn over multiple devices, 5, 10, 20, 100, we can launch sub-processes in parallel and learn all in parallel. When you do comparison, compare in parallel. So it runs fairly fast. It's data-driven and it's configuration independent. Because we go onto the device and soak its current operational data, it doesn't matter how you actually configure the devices, we'd be actually able to soak that operational state and then do a comparison. Remember, the comparison tells you that things changed. You make judgment on whether it's intended or not intended. It's agnostic in the sense that it works across different network operating systems. Out of the box, our team built Cisco XE, XR, and XOS, firewall support, and so on. CableBU also uses it, DNA Center, ACI. But if you're running Juniper, Nokia, well, the good news is we have a Juniper connector, some libraries. Right before I came here, I just wrote a Nokia SROS connector so we can now connect to them. And now the, the rest of the matter is just building more libraries, right? Remember, everything is achieved through libraries. There's a lot of sessions this week on various things. So here's the different sessions you can actually attend to. Uh, I'm going to be slightly biased. I have a session immediately after this on a workshop, so workshop 2808. A little bit of Python programming, so if you are familiar with Python, um, you can attend to the next one right after. There are other ones, for example, the one right before this session, creating parsers. If you're not a programmer, go to 2595, verification for non-programmers. There is also robot framework using Cisco CXTA that also uses elements of PyTS and Genie. There is a lab, walk-in lab, right across on the other side of the hub, where if you go in, walk in lab and say, I want to try PyATS, it's about an hour. So get a little bit of hands-on experience. We have a booth right behind you in the automation journey where you can come and ask any questions. We'll be here all week. Here is the various resources. See, this will be all sent out to you. You can access this online. Everything that we talked about is available on our website. Like I said, the libraries are open source, which means you can go into GitHub and check all of the content that we have. The last thing that I do want to mention is that there are net DevNet certifications. And thank God you are here because we are working with DevNet certification team to add PyTS content. As a matter of fact, we just recently published the latest version of, I believe, DevNet Associate, and we did a bunch of PyTS-based content there. So if you are going for the certification exams, there will be PyTS-based questions. So. The fact that you attended this class probably helped you get started with some of that, right? So PyATS being Cisco-based, the fact that engineering uses it, and the fact that we publish it to customers to use, um, it is going to be part of your certification exam. And there will be, for DevNet professional exams, there will be classroom-based trainings where we provide the content. We will work with trainers to provide the content. So, um, so that's that. Now, hopefully you all enjoyed this session. Hopefully it answers some of your burning questions about Python and Genie, gave you some ideas on what are the applicable use cases and whatnot. Um, do feel free to come up to me for questions. I'll be, I'll have a session right after, but I'll be at my booth for the entire week. And thank you all for attending. Hopefully you have a great week.